Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for December 28th, 2020 through January 3rd, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants, Section 1. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hey, Scriptures, you look a little different from last time we saw you. That's true. We might be studying a new section of the Scriptures. Interesting. How exciting. But now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. Seven minutes, 36 seconds. Okay. And how long would that be daily? One minute, five seconds. So we're off to a good start. You One minute totally and five this. seconds. To every read day. Every day is all you have to do to do this week's reading. You can totally do this. Yes. Yes, you can. We will have a time code, and that time code will be Doctrine and Covenants Section 1. So uh, <laughs> you can just click on that, and it will take you to Doctrine. No, actually, listen, we are going to add a couple of things. We are going to spend today not just talking about Doctrine and Covenants Section 1, but a bit about how we got the Doctrine and Covenants and a little section about the kinds of resources that the church is providing that will really liven up your study this year. So we'll have those two sections before we get to Doctrine and Covenants 1. So you can skip to those if you want as well. I think you'll really find some new and exciting things. But now let's get to the Doctrine and Covenants. So what is the Doctrine and Covenants? Well, the Doctrine and Covenants has an introduction at the beginning of it. And from that introduction, from the very first paragraph, quote, the Doctrine and Covenants is a collection of divine revelations and inspired declarations given for the establishment and regulation of the kingdom of God on the earth in the last days. Although most of the sections are directed to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the messages, warnings, and exhortations are for the benefit of all mankind and contain an invitation to all people everywhere to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to them for their temporal well-being and their everlasting salvation, end quote. Yeah, and we really hear that voice in the Doctrine and Covenants in such a unique way. In the church manual, the teachings of presidents of the church, Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith said, the Doctrine and Covenants is the foundation of the church in these last days and a benefit to the world showing that the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom of our Savior are again entrusted to man. So, John, what language were these scriptures translated from this Doctrine and Covenants? Well, they weren't translated. Hmm. This is one of the things that's really unique about the Doctrine and Covenants. We know that the Old Testament was largely written in Hebrew. We know that the New Testament was largely written in Greek and that the Book of Mormon was largely written in Reformed Egyptian, whatever that language is. But the Doctrine and Covenants is revelation given to Joseph Smith, and it was written in English and then translated to other languages for people around the world. So this is the only book of Scripture we've ever received that was given to us, for those who are English speakers, in our native tongue. That's right. It was not translated. Amazing. Now... How did we get the Doctrine and Covenants? How did it come into being? Well, that is a really interesting story. We're going to hit some of the highlights, but if you're really curious, there's a lot of interesting stuff to go over. Now, as we've already discussed, this is a collection of revelations. And originally, when those revelations were given, they were just written down on whatever loose pieces of paper they had handy. Shortly after the church was organized in 1830, Joseph Smith worked with John Whitmer, one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon, to begin copying these loose sheets of paper into a single volume called the Book of Commandments and Revelations. In late 1831, Oliver Cowdery and John Whitmer traveled to Missouri and took the book with them. A new book was started while they were gone called the Kirtland Revelations, Doctrine and Covenants 76, or the Vision was famously originally recorded there. William W. Phelps began printing some of the revelations in a newspaper he started in Independence, Missouri in early 1832 called The Evening and Morning Star. 
And by the way, what's really neat is that you can actually see complete copies of the Evening and Morning Star in two different locations for free. In the Deseret Book Bookshelf app, you can get a two-volume ebook set for free that contains all of the texts in the Evening and Morning Star. And at archive.org, you can see PDF scans of the original documents. It's great stuff. Going on, in July 1833, William W. Phelps prints a book of commandments for the government of the Church of Christ in Independence, Missouri, containing 65 chapters. We would recognize these revelations today as section 1, section 3 through 12, 14 through 16, 18 to 31, 33 to 50, 52 to 56, and 58 to 64, although they were in slightly different order and organized a little differently. The book was never completed, and the press was destroyed by a mob. And there was a really interesting story about that whole destruction of the printing press, where two young women, Mary Elizabeth Rollins and her sister Caroline, saved a pile of printed revelations from the angry mob by gathering pages and running and hiding in a cornfield. I strongly recommend taking some time to read that story with your family. It's in Saints, Volume 1, Chapter 16 specifically around pages 173 to 179. Really great story of some very brave young women. Shortly after the destruction of the press, the salvaged pages were combined with other pages to create the tiny book called the Book of Commandments. Individual members of the church hand-stitched their own personal copy of these revelations as they were not professionally bound They were simply printed in large proof sheets that would then have to be folded into pages that we'd recognize today. Only 29 copies of the book survive. The Church History Library owns six copies. The Library of Congress has one, and many are in private collections. Wilford Woodruff had a full copy of the proof sheets, though Chapter 65, which we would recognize as DNC 64, was incomplete. So he added some blank pages to his copy and hand wrote the rest of the revelation. And in fact, when Joseph Smith received the revelation known today as section 89 in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Word of Wisdom, Wilford Woodruff hand wrote that revelation in the back of his Book of Commandments. That particular copy of Wilford Woodruff is owned by the Church History Library and can be seen there. It's really pretty cool. So going on, In September 1834, Joseph Smith organized a committee to publish the Revelations as the Book of Covenants. In 1835, the Doctrine and Covenants was published, containing a group of lectures that would later be known as the Lectures on Faith, and 103 sections. The section numbers and orders are different from our current publication, but they were called sections in that edition. And just briefly going through the timeline... There was another edition made in 1844 where eight new sections were added, including John Taylor's tribute to Joseph and Hiram's martyrdom that we now recognize as DNC 135. In 1845, Wilfred Woodruff oversees the first European edition. In 1876, Orson Pratt further adds and reorganizes and breaks up sections into verses. And in 1879, Orson Pratt also revises the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, unifying the volumes and adding footnotes. In 1921, five apostles, including James E. Talmadge, revise the Doctrine and Covenants and give it a two-column look. They also removed the lectures on faith, as they were never canonized as scripture. In 1981, three apostles, Thomas S. Monson, Boyd K. Packer, and Bruce R. McConkie, further revised the look, added richer footnotes integrating with the 1979 Bible, added sections 137 and 138, which had previously been put in the Pearl of Great Price, and added official declarations 1 and 2. In 2013, the Scripture Committee for the Church greatly revised the section headings in line with new historical information largely received through the Joseph Smith Papers Project. And that brings us to today. That's an awesome story. What great sacrifice people gave so that we could have those revelations. So tell me this, we saw the name changes as we went, but why is this book called the Doctrine and Covenants then? So it's the Doctrine and Covenants. In the 1835 edition, remember I had said that the lectures on faith were included at the beginning. This was the Doctrine section. And then the collection of revelations 
were the covenants section. Nice. So it might actually be more appropriate to call it the Book of Covenants today because we don't have the doctrine section, but we still call it the Doctrine and Covenants. Love it. So the revelations, the sections, are they in chronological order? Well, no. They tried to keep them chronological, but that was actually tricky for people to do at the time. They didn't always keep careful track of which revelation was recorded before another. But also you run into situations like the very first section that we're going to talk about today. This was a later revelation, but it was revealed to be a preface or an introduction to the Book of Commandments. So, of course, that has to be first. And then there are situations where revelations that were received even by Joseph Smith were included much later. I mentioned briefly in the timeline that section 137, which was a revelation received by Joseph Smith, wasn't included in the Doctrine and Covenants until 1981. But they didn't want to renumber everything, so they put it at the end, 137. Yeah, and if you're curious, right in the introductory materials of your Doctrine and Covenants is a chronological order of content. So if it's important to you, it's interesting to take a look at where and when the revelations came about. So, John, where can I get more information about the Doctrine and Covenants? Well, there's a lot of great stuff out there. First of all, the Doctrine and Covenants introduction is actually a really good summary of how we got the Doctrine and Covenants, and it includes a testimony from the Twelve Apostles at the time. There's also a really good book that I enjoy called How We Got the Doctrine and Covenants by Richard E. Turley and William W. Slaughter. This is a simple book that is really approachable to pretty much anyone, and it has some great pictures of the different editions and different stories behind how we got the Doctrine and Covenants. There are also a couple of really good Enzyme articles from Robert J. Woodford, who is a great scholar of the Doctrine and Covenants. The first one is The Story of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is in December 1984, Enzyme. And then the second one is How the Revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants Were Received and Compiled. This is January 1985, Enzyme. Oh, that's excellent. So good stuff. Yeah. All right, so what are some suggestions that you might have for helping people in the study of the Doctrine and Covenants in church history this year? What are some extra resources? There are so many great resources, but we'll name a couple of our favorites. Number one, make sure that you read the Come Follow Me manual for 2021. That was designed to help our study this year. So that should be your first stop. And it's great because it's got a lot of questions that you can ask as you go through these sections. Mm -hmm. Also, once again, we love the Institute manual. So seek out the Doctrine and Covenants Student Institute manual it's great. It's got a lot of material in it, and it'll really help. So that's some things that will help with Doctrine and Covenant study. But if you want to broaden your study this year to church history in general, there are several resources that we would really recommend. Number one, Saints Volume 1 and 2. Those books are great, and they're very approachable. You can be at almost any reading level and get something out of it. They're great. They're absolutely wonderful. Also, I'm a big fan of the Church History in the Fullness of Times manual. Yeah. This is an institute manual that instead of having like a section of scripture to read and then having like a commentary or exposition on it, it's just one long historical narrative. And so many of the stories that you hear from church history are compiled in there. They're really good read. Yeah, lots of good images and charts too. Also, I would recommend History of Joseph Smith by his mother, this is by Lucy Mack Smith. This is a great history of Joseph Smith and the church. Also, I'm a big fan of Stephen C. Harper's relatively new book called Joseph Smith's First Vision. This is a compilation of not only the firsthand accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision, but also the secondhand accounts and kind of tying everything together. It's a good book. Stephen Harper is with the Church History Department. Now, a lot of the resources that John's talking about, things like the Come Follow Me, the Doctrine and Covenants Student Institute Manual, and Saints Volumes 1 and 2, Church History in the Fullness of Times, those can all be found in the Gospel Library. Now, this includes the Gospel Library section of the church's website, as well as the Gospel Library app. But here's some additional things that it might be really helpful for you to know about. First of all, click on the section that says Restoration and Church History. That should be kind of like a home button this year for each of us. 
Now, in that section, you'll find another button for Doctrine and Covenant study. This includes Joseph Smith Revelations, a Doctrine and Covenant study companion from the Joseph Smith Papers. I didn't even know that was there. I don't know when they put it up, but... They keep adding new stuff, so that's why it's so good to check this out. That's a great resource. Of course, Revelations in Context, if you're not familiar with that, it's the stories behind the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. We'll be referring to that this year. Also great resource. It really is, and to be able to have it right there. There's also a section in the Restoration and Church History area on the First Vision And you might be saying, well, we've read the first vision. But if you go in there, you can have access to the four primary accounts given by Joseph Smith for his first vision experience. Also, church history topics. I can't stress this one enough. These are awesome. Yes, and there's 187 articles. A lot of them have been added in the last two, three years on all sorts of topics. What kinds of topics, you say? Well, do you know what the ordinance of the washing of feet is? check it out. What about the Danites? Check it out. Elijah Abel, fascinating guy. Who's he? Check it out. Divining rods? What the heck? Check it out. The Godbeites and the Salt Lake Tribune. What do they have in common? Check it out. Who is Sagwitch? What about the Deseret Alphabet? Do you want to know? Check it out. There's so many fascinating stories, and these aren't really long articles, most of them. So if you just want to have fun and just want to spark your enthusiasm for church history this year, just pick a random topic in the church history topic section and check it out. I bet you'll be delighted and surprised. There's also a section in this area for church history videos. Some of these are related to the saints books and others are like this one answers to church history questions. That's a really great series as well. And then there's a whole women's history thing. And there's a lot more. So check it out and really get familiar with the resources in your gospel library under Restoration and Church History. You will be so glad you did. There really are a ton of resources for church history. It's one of the most well-documented thing that we have in the church. And it really should be. It's relatively new. It's only 200 years old. Even then, I'm surprised at how much we're still missing. Right. Well, that's true. We'll talk about some of that as we go, but still, what a treasure. Well, as I was preparing for this lesson, I came across a quote from the Old Gospel Doctrine Manual from President Ezra Taft Benson that I wanted to include here. This is from April 1987 General Conference. He says, quote, The Doctrine and Covenants brings men to Christ's kingdom, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. The Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion, and the Doctrine and Covenants is the capstone with continuing Latter-day Revelation. The Lord has placed his stamp of approval on both the keystone and the capstone, end quote. So there's an interesting image there. Yeah. As we were going over this, I came across a, another quote in the Gospel Doctrine Manual This is from President Joseph Fielding Smith, and I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to include it here. He says, quote, In my judgment, there is no book on earth yet come to man as important as the book known as the Doctrine and Covenants. With all due respect to the Book of Mormon and the Bible and the Pearl of Great Price, which we say are our standards in doctrine, the Doctrine and Covenants to us stands in a peculiar position above them all going to tell you why. When I say that, do not for a moment think I do not value the Book of Mormon, the Bible, and the Pearl of Great Price just as much as any man that lives. I think I do. I do not know of anybody who has read them more, and I appreciate them. They're wonderful. They contain doctrine and revelation and commandments that we should heed, but the Bible is a history containing the doctrine and commandments given to the people anciently. This applies also to the Book of Mormon. It is the doctrine and the history of the commandments of the people who dwelt upon this continent anciently. But this doctrine and covenants contains the word of God to those who dwell here now. It is our book. It belongs to the Latter-day Saints. More precious than gold, the prophet says we should treasure it more than the riches of the whole earth. I wonder if we do. If we value it, understand it, 
and know what it contains, we value it more than wealth. It is worth more to us than the riches of the earth, end quote. That's from his book, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 3. It's a great way to look at the Doctrine and Covenants. So let's jump into it. Doctrine and Covenants, Section 1. Here we are. This is an exciting section. Of it, President Ezra Taft Benson said, quote, The Doctrine and Covenants is the only book in the world that has a preface written by the Lord himself. In that preface, he declares to the world that his voice is unto all men, that the coming of the Lord is nigh, and that the truths found in the Doctrine and Covenants will all be fulfilled, end quote. How exciting. That's from mm. General Conference, October 1986. I found that in the old Gospel Doctrine Manual. Now, you mentioned earlier that Section 1 was not in chronological order. So how did this come about? Well, that's true. What happened is that by November 1831, Joseph Smith had received more than 60 revelations. However, most church members did not have access to copies of them. So the prophet convened a conference of elders in Hiram, Ohio, on November 1st, 1831, and they debated whether or not to publish Joseph's revelations for several hours. But they did finally decide to publish the revelations. William E. McClellan, Oliver Cowdery, and possibly Sidney Rigdon worked together to write a preface to the Book of Commandments. But the elders in the conference were not satisfied with it. They requested Joseph to inquire of the Lord. And now this next part is a quote from Revelations in Context. After bowing in prayer with the conference, Joseph, according to William E. McClellan, dictated by the Spirit the preface, doing so as he sat by a window of the room in which the conference was sitting. McClellan remembered that Joseph would deliver a few sentences and Sidney Rigdon would write them down, then read them aloud. And if correct, then Joseph would proceed and deliver more. According to McClellan, by this process, the preface, now Doctrine and Covenants 1, was given. Interesting side note, revelations now known as DNC 65 through 68 were actually received that same conference before Doctrine and Covenants section 1, but for one reason or another were not included in the Book of Commandments. But, of course, we have them in the Doctrine and Covenants today. We sure do. And yep. speaking of the Doctrine and Covenants, let's start in verse 1. Ooh, I can't wait. Yeah, and while we take a look at this, look for words or phrases that the Lord uses to get our attention. Right at the beginning, he says, hearken. That's the first word. Hearken, O ye people of my church, saith the voice of him who dwells on high, and whose eyes are upon all men. Yea, verily I say, hearken ye people from afar, and ye that are upon the isles of the sea, listen together. For verily the voice of the Lord is unto all men, and there is none to escape, and there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear, neither heart that shall not be penetrated. And the rebellious shall be pierced with much sorrow, for their iniquity shall be spoken upon the housetops, and their secret acts shall be revealed. Now, if you remember from our study last year, and also from listening to General Conference, President Nelson has talked to us about the notion of hearken, yeah. being to listen with the intent to obey. Yeah, and notice the number of times that concept is used here. But the Lord makes it clear coming up who will be delivering his message, this message. Going on in verse 4. And the voice of warning shall be unto all people by the mouths of my disciples, whom I have chosen in these last days. And they shall go forth, and none shall stay them, for I, the Lord, have commanded them. From the Institute Manual, I found a really neat quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. I'm going to be quoting from him a lot in this lesson. But he spoke earlier, the quote from Doctrines of Salvation, about the Doctrine and Covenants being our book. But he clarifies that. And certainly the first five verses here, this is not just directed to members of the church. This is directed to everyone. He says in October 1919 General Conference, quote, This DNC is my book and your book. But more than that, it belongs to all the world, to the Catholics, 
to the Presbyterians, to the Methodists, to the non-believer. It is his book if he will accept it, if he will receive it. The Lord has given it unto the world for their salvation. If you do not believe it, you read the first section in this book, the preface, and you will find that the Lord has sent this book and the things which it contains unto the people afar off, on the islands of the sea, in foreign lands. And his voice is unto all people that all may hear. And so I say it belongs to all the world, not only to the Latter-day Saints, and they will be judged by it, and you will be judged by it, end quote. That's wonderful. So let's go on to verse 6. This is the announcement of this section being the preface of the Book of Commandments. Behold, this is mine authority, he says in verse 6, and the authority of my servants, and my preface unto the Book of My Commandments, which I have given them to publish unto you, O inhabitants of the earth. Wherefore, fear and tremble, O ye people, for what I, the Lord, have decreed in them shall be fulfilled. Wow. Now, in 8 through 10, the Lord declares that he will judge all people according to their actions and how they treat others. Going on in verse 12, prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come, for the Lord is nigh. And the anger of the Lord is kindled, and his sword is bathed in heaven, and it shall fall upon the inhabitants of the earth. Now, I've got to pause there. My son, Brendan, came home from seminary one morning some years ago and said, Dad, I read this really cool thing. And he pointed out that phrase, that God's sword is bathed in heaven. Now, I don't know what image that conjures up for you, but... To me, it's incredible, and I have never noticed it. And it really stuck out to Brendan, and it's stuck out to me ever since. His sword is bathed in heaven. Now, let's look at that just a little bit. How is sword used? Well, throughout the scriptures, and certainly the Doctrine and Covenants, the sword is the Word of God. And he often begins a section with this idea in Doctrine and Covenants 6 and 11 and 12 and 14 and 33. And then in 27, the sword, he talks about the armor of God there. It's the sword of the Spirit, which again is the Word of God. So although a sword can be used in a punishment sense, and maybe it is here, but try reading it with it being the Word of God. His anger is kindled and his sword or his word which is bathed in heaven, soaked in heaven, saturated with heaven, it will fall on the inhabitants of the earth. I just love that imagery. That's very exciting. (laughs) That's really neat. I don't know how I would ever paint something like that, but I love the look of it. In verse 14, he uses another image, and the arm of the Lord shall be revealed. And the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. There's an interesting image, and one might ask, why arm of the Lord? What does that mean? From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible for the term arm. It says, quote, Although the word arm must have been commonly used in ancient colloquial Hebrew to designate the strength of men, It is used in the overwhelming majority of instances in the Bible for the strength of God. The most vividly anthropomorphic picture of God's arm in action is in Isaiah 3030, which depicts the lightning as the descending blow of his arm. There are many references also to God's arm as outstretched in a militant gesture, but in most of these cases, it is probable that the phrase has lost its original pictorial vividness and is merely a conventional expression for God's irresistible power, as is obviously the case in Jeremiah 32:17, where outstretched arm is synonymous with great power, end quote. Yeah, and you'll find that same usage throughout the Doctrine and Covenants, although there's kind of an interesting use of it. In Doctrine and Covenants 35 that I thought we could connect in here because we're talking about all that God is pouring out and doing it by his servants. In verse 35, 13, and 14, it says, Wherefore I call upon the weak things of the world, 
those who are unlearned and despised, to thresh the nations with the power of my spirit, and their arm shall be my arm, and I will be their shield, and he goes on. But I love that idea of, remember, our job isn't to do this on our own, whether it's our own personal callings or missionary work we're called to do or whatever. We need to be connected to God's arm, his power, and that's where we'll find power. There was another phrase in there, too, this idea at the end of 14, that they shall be cut off. And to be cut off, it means that they will be separated from the righteous and lose the blessings that are available through gospel ordinances and covenants. So if we can think about that in those terms, why would we want to be cut off? But let's get back to the section. Why will they be cut off? Verse 15, For they have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken mine everlasting covenant. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. From the Institute Manual, I found a very powerful quote from President Spencer W. Kimball. This is from his book, Miracle of Forgiveness. He says, quote, Many people build and furnish a home and buy the automobile first, and then find that they cannot afford to pay tithing. Whom do they worship? Certainly not the Lord of heaven and earth. For we serve whom we love and give first consideration to the object of our affection and desires. End quote. Yeah, that's very true. Now, coming up in verse 17, the Lord is going to talk about the challenges and destructions and issues of the last days as a calamity. And it's important to note that with that, the Lord gives solutions to help us through the calamities of the last days. And you could find these and explore these in 17 through 33. So keep an eye out for those as we read. In verse 17, Wherefore I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments. So right away, we've got a solution. What's one of the solutions for the calamities? Well, Joseph Smith is called and he is given revelations and commandments from heaven. So maybe as you read this, wonder to yourself, talk with your friends and family, how is that a solution to calamity? How is a prophet, how do the revelations and commandments, how are they a solution to calamity? Verse 18. And also gave commandments to others that they should proclaim these things unto the world. You see another one right there. And all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. That man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh, but that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world that faith also might increase in the earth, that mine everlasting covenant might be established, that the fullness of the gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. So what about this? How are God's servants going through the earth to proclaim his gospel and establish his covenant? How is that a solution to calamity? I really like verse 21. Because sometimes as we're serving in the church and especially, say, as a full-time missionary, we might have a certain measurement of success that may not be the Lord's measurement for success. And I find comfort in verse 21. One of the reasons that his servants go throughout the world is that faith might increase in the earth. Have you given an act of service? that in some small way helped someone's faith to increase? I often will mention to the missionaries, the very act that they're out there in public gets people thinking about God for moments that they wouldn't have been thinking about God before. Does that help to increase faith in the earth? What about 
smile or an optimistic thought, a comforting gesture. These are all ways that faith might increase in the earth. And so I find real comfort in that idea. And what about verse 23, the notion of the gospel being proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world? Why the weak and the simple? Mm. Well, I think we'll talk about this probably every year because this is the way that the Lord works. One of the reasons why I feel he uses the weak and the simple is that there is no question now, both to the person proclaiming the gospel and the person receiving the gospel, that this is coming from God. It's not a situation where someone's a charismatic speaker or maybe very smart. This is from God. To further that thought, there's a quote from the Institute Manual from President Joseph Fielding Smith again, as I had promised. This is from his book, Church History and Modern Revelation, Volume 1. He says, quote, The Lord called Joseph Smith and others from among the weak things of the world because he and his associates were contrite and humble. The great and mighty ones in the nations the Lord could not use because of their pride and self-righteousness. The Lord's ways are not man's ways, and he cannot choose those who in their own judgment are too wise to be taught. Therefore, he chooses those who are willing to be taught, and he makes them mighty even to the breaking down of the great and mighty. When we think of our missionary system, we can see how the weak have gone forth among the strong ones and have prevailed. The mighty and strong ones have been broken down by the humble elders, and I would add sisters, of the church, end quote. Yeah, so true. I don't know, John, if you felt that experience on your mission of being simple and that work was happening far beyond what your capacity was. Absolutely. Not only as a missionary, but also seeing missionary work done by others and more recently by the missionary work done by my own son who came nice. home not too long ago. It That's is awesome. a powerful thing to watch. Yeah, amazing. Well, let's keep going in verse 24, and maybe we should ask this question. Are God's servants flawless? In verse 24, Behold, I am God, and have spoken it. These commandments are of me, and were given unto my servants in their weakness, after the manner of their language, that they might come to understanding. And inasmuch as they erred, it might be made known. And inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed. And inasmuch as they sinned, they might be chastened, that they might repent. And inasmuch as they were humble, they might be made strong and blessed from on high and receive knowledge from time to time. That's so important, including the wonderful description of the fact that we shouldn't be holding those that God has called to our standards. The Lord knows who he's chosen and why. And so seeing the Lord's work through these people rather than judging these people. But I also really like in 24 when he says, after the manner of their language, the Lord is speaking and will continue to speak to us after the manner of our language. Why? So that we might come to understanding. The way God speaks to us today may be different than the way he speaks to someone in a different area of the world or my neighbor or someone at a different time. He'll speak to us in our language that we can come to understanding. Very true. In the next couple of verses, we're going to go over the testimony of the Book of Mormon and of the true and living church from the Lord. Verse 29, And after having received the record of the Nephites, we all know what that is if you studied with us last year. Mm -hmm. Yea, even my servant Joseph Smith Jr. might have power to translate through the mercy of God by the power of God, the Book of Mormon. Okay, here's another one. Remember, we were talking about those things that God would give us to help solve calamity. Here's a question. How can receiving the Book of Mormon help solve calamity in our own lives or in the life of the world? And speaking of the life of the world, verse 30, And also those to whom these commandments were given might have power to lay the foundation of this church and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness, the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth with which I, the Lord, 
am well pleased, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually. Now, notice there too, how was restoring his church upon the earth? How does that help solve calamity? And I love that imagery too, that he's bringing it forth out of obscurity and darkness. Remember, the church wasn't gone. If you've watched our episode on the apostasy, you recognize the church has been here the whole time, but it's been diminished. And now Christ is bringing forth out of darkness, meaning adding light to his church. And what a beautiful image that is. And what does that mean, the only true and living church? Mm. From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from A. Theodore Tuttle from General Conference, April 1975, quote, There is much difference between a dead and living church. While one may have the form and shape, the ritual and dimension, the living church has life. A living prophet leads the church today. There is a vibrant, living movement to it, a captivating spirit about it, a glory to it that lifts and builds and helps and blesses the lives of all it touches. The church will move forward to its divine destiny, end quote. Agreed. But with all the helps to deal with calamity, look at what happens if we reject what the Lord has given. In verse 33, And he that repents not from him shall be taken, even the light which he has received. For my spirit will not always strive with man, saith the Lord of hosts. Going on in 34, And again, verily I say unto you, O inhabitants of the earth, I, the Lord, am willing to make these things known unto all flesh. For I am no respecter of persons, and will that all men shall know that the day speedily cometh, the hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand, when peace shall be taken from the earth, and the devil shall have power over his own dominion. And also, the Lord shall have power over his saints, and shall reign in their midst, and shall come down in judgment upon Idumea, or the world. Uh, Idumea? From the Institute Manual, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, this is from Mormon Doctrine, quote, Idumea, or Edom, of which Basra was the principal city, was a nation to the south of the Salt Sea, through which the trade route, called the King's Highway, ran between Egypt and Arabia. The Idumeans, or Edomites, were a wicked, non-Israelitish people, Hence, traveling through their country symbolized to the prophetic mind the pilgrimage of men through a wicked world. And so, Idumea meant the world, end quote. Makes sense, now that you've explained it. And we also get a real confirmation of that notion that this is meant for everybody in verses 34 and 35, that God is no respecter of persons. This isn't meant to be revelation just to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is meant to be for the world. Verse 37, search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth shall pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. A couple of really powerful thoughts in there. Number one, a real strong admonition to search these commandments. So that's what we'll be doing this year. But we should continue to do that as we continue to study the scriptures. And from the Institute Manual, we have another quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. This is from Church History and Modern Revelation, Volume 1. He says, quote, All members of the church are commanded to search and obey these commandments. This is also true of all others. If we fail to do so and remain ignorant of the doctrines, covenants, and commandments the Lord has given us, we shall stand condemned before his throne in the day of judgment. When the books are opened, it behooves us to search that we may know the will of the Lord and thus grow in faith, knowledge, and wisdom. End quote. Great. But one other thought there in verse 38, not only does the Lord bear testimony that he is speaking, but also that when his servants speak in his name, it is the same as if he spoke to us directly. Yeah. And how do we know that? 
is emphasized in that next verse, 39. For behold and lo, the Lord is God, and the Spirit beareth record, and the record is true, and the truth abideth forever and ever. Amen. Wow. That is an amazing revelation. Yeah, so good. From the Gospel Doctrine Manual, there was a quote that I found from President Gordon B. Hinckley that I just wanted to include at the end of our lesson. He says, quote, This is a season of a thousand opportunities. It is ours to grasp and move forward. What a wonderful time it is for each of us to do his or her small part in moving the work of the Lord on to its magnificent destiny, end quote. That's from Ah. October 1997 General Conference. What a motivator. Very exciting. So what do we do with this? I would propose that as we study this year, think about how searching the scriptures has blessed your lives. How have you seen prophetic promises fulfilled in your life? Discuss that, contemplate that, and remember And if you don't think you've seen how searching the scriptures has blessed your lives, it's time to start searching the scriptures. You could do it right now. You could. And you could do it with us. We'll be here. Yeah, and this week it's only going to take you 7 minutes and 36 seconds. And here's a hint, people. Our reading assignments this year are going to be a lot lighter than last year. And it makes sense if you think about it. For example, I've done reading schedules, and I can tell you that on average, reading the Book of Mormon within a calendar year, will take you five minutes a day. Reading the Doctrine and Covenants will take you less than two minutes. So you can do this. <laughs> yeah, and you know you what? You can do this. More than just reading, search the commandments. Ask questions, scrutinize them, and expect answers from the Scriptures. When we do that, the Lord is excited to show us the light that He has. So true. And we'll look forward to talking to you more about the Doctrine and Covenants in our next lesson. Oh, we'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>